Be sure and I hope you have your bulletin because the scripture we're going to read is from the message. And so I'm using some phrases here, so we're not going to use NIV or New Revised Standard, so get that. And then I'm not going to refer a lot to the back, but there are some notes for you to take home, some questions that we're going to ask ourselves afterwards. So this is kind of a, a take-home piece. So how many of you use social media? How many of you use social or will, will admit to using social media? How about uh, anybody on uh, Facebook? Anybody here on Facebook? I know you are. You're my friends, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm watching you. Some of you won't uh, let me befriend you. I'm not sure you want me to see you at every place you're at, I guess. I don't, I don't know about that. Instagram? Anyone on Instagram? Twitter? Nobody's following the president? OK. And Snapchat? Anyone on Snapchat? OK. Have you ever posted a picture of your child or grandchild? OK. There's a new app, and it's called Tiny Beans. Anybody have it? So our niece out in, in uh, Seattle gave us this app. I mean, said, get on this app, because she had a baby. I get a picture of that baby every single day. It doesn't matter what that baby's doing. I get a video, a picture every single day. It's like I'm there. Is that right, Kathleen? Yeah. Tiny beans. Photos and videos these days are limitless. They're virtually worldwide and instant, or can be, from blogging routines of what kind of coffee you had to uh, important times of the baby's first steps or your child's wedding. In 2007, our smartphones changed the way our culture does photography. It used to be you'd just get a picture of your wallet. Here's the little child. Now it's how many hours do you have? I've got thousands of pictures on my, on my cell phone, and I take everything. That was 2007. There's a new word out since 2013. Have you heard that word? Sharenting. You see the definition of it? Sharenting. Oversharing details about the kids on social media. It's a combination of the words sharing and parenting. I'll give you a word of caution, though. Sharenting can lead to unauthorized phenomena known as digital kidnapping. So be careful what you post out there, where innocent photographs have turned up on inappropriate websites. But today's scripture, <laughs> let me get a photo of that right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here's a baby crying yeah. in church in the middle of my sermon. Today's scripture is not just like a proud digital sharenting, but it's more like a divine sharenting. God the Father is like a proud daddy who's bragging to the whole world, here's my son. And the key verse that we're going to focus on is when the voice from the cloud says, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. These are the exact words he said three years ago at Jesus' baptism. And they have also been reposted by Mark and Luke in their Gospels. So let's read the Word of God from Matthew's Gospels. Listen to God's Word to you. Six days later, three of them saw that glory. Jesus took Peter and the brothers James and John and led them up a high mountain. His appearance changed from the inside out right before their eyes. Sunlight poured from his face. His clothes were filled with light. Then they realized that Moses and Elijah were also there in deep conversation with him. Well, Peter broke in, Master, this is a great moment. What would you think if I built three memorials here on the mountain? One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he was going on like this, babbling, a light, radiant cloud enveloped them, and sounding from deep in the cloud a voice, This is my son, 
marked by my love, focus of my delight, listen to him. When the disciples heard it, they fell flat on their faces, scared to death. But Jesus came over and touched them. Don't be afraid. When they opened their eyes and looked around, all they saw was Jesus, only Jesus. Coming down from the mountain, Jesus swore them to secrecy, don't breathe a word of what you've seen. After the Son of Man is raised from the dead, you are free to talk. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we come to this special Sunday, this Transformation Sunday, asking for your Spirit's guidance to help us take away what we might understand more clearly that would bring us more nearly to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today's the last Sunday before the 40 days of Lent, the 40 days that are supposed to be a preparation for us to celebrate this wonderful event of resurrection. It's called Transfiguration Sunday. And it's always this Sunday before Lent, before Ash Wednesday, because it has a purpose. Just like Lent is preparing us for Easter, Transfiguration Sunday is preparing us for Lent. Here we have a very important time in Jesus' life uh, for his disciples and really for ourselves as well. As we would prepare to understand who this Jesus is who is in front of these disciples radiating pure, unadulterated light. We're told that it's six days later. Well, six days from what? Six days from when they were at Caesarea Philippi, and Peter is the one who announces his great confession, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. And this event of transfiguration is preceded by the last part of the previous chapter where Jesus predicts his death. Over and over we find Jesus predicting his death, and the disciples just don't get it. They don't want to hear that about what's going to happen when they all get to Jerusalem. It's interesting because here it says that uh, they go to a mountain, but not just any mountain, it's a high mountain. Now those are those little adjectives that you need to stop and pause. The only other time that word is used in the Gospel of Matthew is when Jesus is go undergoing his temptations on a high mountain. So you, you got to think, something special is about to happen here. And it is. Jesus is transformed. The Greek here is metamorpho, which, as you know, is metamorphosis. Peterson describes it as we read, his appearance changed from the inside out right before their eyes. Sunlight poured from his face, and even his clothes filled with light. And to further reinforce the sacredness of this moment, suddenly the appearance of Moses and Elijah, and they're talking to Jesus. And I've always wondered, what are they talking about? It's important they mention they just didn't appear. They're actually in discussion with Jesus. What are they talking about? I've always wanted to uh, think about heaven as a place that I can go, and, and it's my bucket list of who I want to talk to. Hey, Moses, were those tablets really heavy when you carried them down the mountain? You know, important theological questions. Who would you talk about? Who would you talk with when, if you had a chance? Anybody. Here they are talking. The epitome of the Old Testament. Moses, the law. Elijah, the prophets. The law and the prophets. And Jesus Christ. Obviously, Jesus is being lifted up. 
to this prophetic tradition of the two greatest people in the Old Testament. Peter's response to this manifestation of the holy is first <laughs> to observe how good it is that he and the other disciples are present, and secondly, to offer to build three memorials to commemorate their epiphanal event. But do you notice while Peter is speaking that this cloud comes and envelops them, overshadows them, and he's interrupted with a voice from the cloud, which as I said is the key verse of this passage, this is my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Even though the disciples are enveloped in this cloud, Jesus is still shining. The divine declaration from the cloud is so remarkably astonishing that it renders Peter's response to the vision as somewhat inconsequential. The story ends in typical fashion. Upon hearing this voice, the disciples are terrified, fearful, to which Jesus gives that habitual attempt to be comforting, don't be afraid. That must be taught in Divine Being 101, because all the angels say the same thing. Don't worry about it. Don't be afraid. I've just been sent here by God to give you a message. People are trembling in the presence of the holy. And finally, once Jesus is alone with the disciples, he orders them not to speak about this vision until, and did you get that? After the resurrection. They don't know what's about to happen. But he says, don't say a word until after the resurrection. Until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is a pivotal passage in Matthew. Both the transformed Jesus and his order that he just gives his disciples to delay talking about the vision, they all point forward to the resurrection, to the risen Jesus, to the Easter Sunday that we're celebrating. And at the same time, the voice from the cloud calling Jesus the beloved Son points back to that same voice and message heard from heaven when Jesus emerges from the water in his baptism. Transfiguration, Transfiguration Sunday is pointing forward and pointing backwards at the same time. It's the pivot. Similar to the way Jesus' baptism inaugurates his public ministry, the transfiguration that we celebrate today marks the heightening of the stakes in Jesus' ministry, which we know lead to the cross and the empty tomb of Calvary. This is why the transfiguration is perfect for us to study and learn and pray about and read this morning. It heightens our own stakes as followers of Jesus Christ in preparing ourselves for these 40 days of spiritual growth and attention. So I want to just offer a couple of quick thoughts for you to consider as you prepare for Wednesday, which is Ash Wednesday, and your 40 days. What are you going to do differently this year that you've done in previous years? That this Lent will be a very special time of spiritual growth for you. That's the question. First thing, Peter's response. One might well expect that this metamorphosis of a radiant Jesus flanked by Moses and Elijah, they've come back from the dead, would stun a witness into gaping silence. Not Peter. <laughs> no, no. Peter starts talking from the get-go about doing something. And for that matter, to do it with a fairly inflated view of himself. Notice how after claiming it's good for us to be here, 
Peter says, I will make three dwellings. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Peter wants to build a memorial that preserves the memory of this divine event. And we know that memory is a profound dimension of how faith stays alive through Scripture. But memory is only valuable to the extent that looking back bolsters our awareness that God is in our midst right now, not stuck somewhere in the past. Memorials serve us best when they keep us currently faithful to our ever-present God who's always leading us into the future. The problem with more memorials, however, is how despite our best intentions, they can devolve into a tidy keepsake box that preserve holiness like some memento in which we can return when it's convenient for us. And when we do that, then the divine is treated like a mere commodity. Peter's response can inspire us to make a memorial this Lent for God to be in your life as someone to celebrate his presence with you right now, in the presence, radiating his light in your life, his glory before your very eyes. And then allow that glory and majesty and splendor to be reflected to others as you would reflect this light that's being radiated from Jesus Christ. So think about Peter's response as you prepare for your 40 days of Lent. And remember that the key verse here is the one divine voice speaking from the cloud, this is my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. God answers Peter, actually interrupts him. And all like Peter, whenever any of us respond to the holy, as if we know how to domesticate God and manage God's presence in our life, that we can't limit God by putting him in this little described box, that what God does is to say, listen to Jesus Christ. Don't confine me in a box. Listen to Jesus Christ. It's a command. It's in the imperative. It's a d divine directive. Listen to him. And so a big question for all of us as we leave this service and begin our 40 days, how will you listen to him this Lent? How do you listen to Jesus? That's what you want to take away from this service. How are you going to answer that? First thought is to be still long enough to listen to the one with whom God is well pleased. The only one who knows what is needful heading into a future that God has in store for each of us, everyone here, and in fact the entire world. Be still long enough this Lent. Second step in listening is to be still long enough that as you quiet yourself to listen, you can reflect. Reflect on the glory of this one who is himself radiating the light. How beautiful are the hands, is what Twyla Paris is going to say in many different ways. Reflect on that kind of a thought of this person in front of you. Such glory isn't an entitlement to pri of privilege for his disciples, followers. It's a source of sacred empowerment for us to understand the glory of God. It energizes and equips us to then accompany Christ throughout the intensity of his ministry as he's heading to Jerusalem and to the cross as it will help us to intensify our following of him. So be still and reflect. Also a third step in listening this Lent 
is to hear this instruction from the crowd not as a rebuke, but as words of encouragement. To recognize and follow the one who best exemplifies what it means to be a beloved child of God who knows and carries out what is it that pleases God to provide blankets for those in need. I'm sure that must please God. And what other things do? Fourth step, listen to him in order that you might comprehend who God empowers you to be. Only then can you begin to get a handle on what God empowers you to do. God doesn't need us to build memorials, like Peter blurted out, but to be a memorial. Living memorials who reflect Christ in how we conduct our lives, not as something in the past, but as a living memorial moving into the future. God says, listen to him. I put three questions on the back of your bulletin for you to look at. Take them home and answer them to yourselves. How do you go about listening to Jesus? In what form do his words come to you to which you listen? How will you be a better listener this season? In closing, Two answers come immediately to mind. Listen to him speak to you in his very own words, which means open your Bible, read it, pray it, meditate on it, memorize it. Let Jesus speak to you with his very own words. If you read two chapters a day from the Gospels. You can get through all four of them in in 40 days. A little bit more than two chapters. So get into his word and then listen to him as you seek a fresh divine direction to a specific situation in your life through your prayers. Silent prayers, spoken prayers, individual prayers, corporate prayers. It says, listen to him. As I've been told many times, God gave us two ears and one mouth. We're supposed to listen twice as much as we speak. Listen to God in your prayers. Whether it's through the word of God or through your prayers with God, may all of us be changed from the inside out as we seek to be spiritually transformed this Lent. As Paul says to the Ephesians, as I was right around this table with the new officers on Wednesday night, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, may it be so for you this Lent. Amen.